And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a returning good brother to the temple, the king of Tristat, the man who is currently kickstarting the expanded version of Big Eye Small Mouth, known as Besom Extras, the one and only Diskami. How are you doing today, man? Uh, thanks, Mildra, for having me on. Mm -hmm. Thanks for thanks for coming back on. I know I um <laughs> realized that it I ended up making the request halfway through the um the Kickstarter. Because, because unfortunately, I made the mistake of not signing up for a mailing list. But a uh, bit better late than never. Better late than never, I suppose. And I and I will give my congratulations for getting three times your um your funding goal at the time of this recording. Yeah, thanks. It's been going really well, and uh, we're hoping to still press on and in the last little bit that we have here in the coming weeks to to unlock some additional stretch goals for the everyone, all the fans. Now, it's been it's been a bit it's been a bit since um, fourth edition was re was released. So, in lieu of in lieu of some sort of post mortem style thing, what would you what would you say were some of the big takeaways that you ended up get that you ended up getting from fourth edition in terms of how in terms of how it turned out and what and what people mentioned that they liked and were critical of. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, I guess the first thing is be wary of the printers that you use because <laughs> we ended up having a, a huge problem with our production on um, delayed in timing. Obviously, you know, producing a book during the COVID time isn't the best uh, thing to be doing anyway, but mm -hmm. we worked with a printer, a new one for the first time based on our recommendation, and uh, that turned out to be a, a big mistake. So the when we ended the Kickstarter last year, and that was in September, then we sent everyone the PDFs uh, of the game because it was finished promptly thereafter. And so last fall in 2019, everyone had the PDFs of the game, but they didn't actually receive the printed copies uh, of their physical pledges until September 2020. Uh, and, you know, we feel really terrible about that. Some of it was beyond our control. Other ones is maybe, I guess, we made bad choices who to work with. So we're not working with the same people the next time. So the biggest takeaway with that, doubt is do your research if you're going to be printing some books with a new printer mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of the book itself uh yeah there's a a huge demand for Bessem coming back i mean certainly the kickstarter was a success with 1700 backers that came on and then a bunch of late pledges passed there which is wonderful but on drive through uh, rpg where we're selling the pdfs of the product uh, we ended up reaching gold status really quite quickly and we're probably a few months away from hitting platinum status on there for sales. So there's a lot of people that want the game, uh, whether it's nostalgia factor, whether people are looking for a comprehensive and robust point-based multi-genre system uh, again, or maybe it's it's a resurgence because a lot of people are sitting at home and they're looking for stuff to read and play online with their friends uh, because of COVID. So maybe that's why it's done so well. But without a doubt, the, the biggest thing we can take away is that people will have been wanting this product for a while, and I'm really glad we had an opportunity to bring it to them. Yeah. And obvious, obviously, I... Um... I I did my own video cover, covering covering Besom a while back, and one of the one of the things that I had noticed was that it was it obviously was a lot simpler. It it felt it felt a lot more straightforward than a lot of the crunchiness that happened with um, third edition, which I remember third edition. I, I remember feeling third edition leaned a little bit into GURPS e territory. Yeah, it went a little uh, heavier, I think, and that was a lot of it was the carryover from Silver Age Sentinels and the Tristat DX that we had. So, fourth edition isn't incredibly different than third edition in terms of the level of of how the system runs. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a similar system, but we did a couple of really important things that did streamline it. And part of it was we took out a lot of the the options and the enhancements of you know whether it's uh, you know, called shots or or tactical actions and, and difficult things that added more crunch to the game, but we decided they'd be better for a, a, a standalone 
expansion, which is what Bessem Extras is. Uh, and in addition, we also streamlined the point values a lot down and, and really worked on the presentation of the book. So it's presented in a much more streamlined fashion, I think, uh, yeah. much more handholding. And I mean, just from the, even just the page count went from 240 to mm -hmm. 350. Mm -hmm. So it went up by almost 50, pretty well 50%. But the game did not get more complex. The game got actually less complex because yeah. it was presented in a different way. That was our goal. And, you know, to hear you say it, uh, it sounds like we, we met that goal. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that hand-holding can be kind of a dirty word in gaming parlance. Um, but I've, of I've often had the counter-argument that avoiding hand-holding should not mean... Um, embracing what I've called hand breaking, um, and for and the sore, hand breaking is a ter is a term that we came up with because we wanted something that described the polar opposite of hand holding, where um, solutions are so ob are so obtuse that it would be hard for you to know what to do unless you ha unless you had a sufficient amount of foreknowledge or a str or some sort of guide or something like that. Um, a lot of point-and-click adventures are guilty parties of this. A lot of them. Including every King's Quest game I've ever played in my life. Um, but I'd ar but I'd argue I'd argue that uh, that I think I think avoiding hand breaking is more important than whether or not uh, hand holding is a, is a good or bad thing. Oh. Well, and, and and I agree with you on, on that certainly. But uh, when it comes to role playing games, the interesting thing, of course, is uh, almost everyone I've talked to, how'd you get into role playing? It's almost always someone introduced it to them. Very rarely does does a group do a group of people get together who've had no experience collectively and decide to start role playing and start. Yeah. Uh, almost always, it's someone introducing that, like I know how to role play. I'm going to introduce my children or my mm -hmm. friend or or a school class, for example. And because of that is what happens, often what we're getting is you're passing down that institutional knowledge. But it doesn't mean that the information should not still be in a book to try to make it as accessible as possible. And we know that not every role-playing game is equally accessible for first-time users. There's no doubt about that. And certainly Bessem, as a, a multi-genre, universal system, so you can do anything. This isn't a focus genre, focus setting. This is any setting, any power level. Uh, by the very nature of what it is, it's going to be a little bit more complex to try to understand, which is why we focus so much on what, perhaps the hand-holding or the presentation of the book to take people through step by step by step to make it as easy as possible. Now, could a person that knows nothing about role-playing, has never heard of a role-playing game, pick up a book and, and run a game with it? That's still going to be really difficult, I mean, for any game like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and that really wasn't kind of the focus of Bessem. Now we have Bessem Naked, which is a lighter version of Bessem, which is kind of a stripped-down version of it. That's why we call mm -hmm. it Bessem Naked, stripped down with the rules. But I, I would argue in some ways it's actually more difficult and more, less approachable because it doesn't give quite as much of that hand-holding. So if you are used to role-playing games, if you know what that is, then Naked might be a great way to jump in because it is so so easy uh, and simplified and stripped down and open-ended if you're familiar with them already. But if you're not, then maybe the, the more comprehensive book of Beth and Forth Edition is what people are looking for. Yeah. And incidentally, that's the reason why... Um why when I did my review, I kind I kind of glossed over um, naked, large largely because I felt I felt like if I felt like I um, if I were to go more in depth with naked, then I would have been repeating myself. Yeah, well, certainly. I mean, it is the exact same game. It's yeah. just it takes uh, like all the text and strips it down to buy about a two-thirds like it yeah. you'd think well how can you have the same game but it's two-thirds as big and part of it is taking out some of the 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 more extraneous information like the the game master section for example a lot of advice on how to run games and different types of genres you can strip all that out and just assume that people are going to know what what they're doing because it is for people that uh, are more experienced or are more open to freeform type role playing but in addition it's just rewording stuff so while Bessem core book uh, might have several paragraphs about 
uh, a particular power, we strip it down just to the core nuggets in Naked, which is why the book is, is 144 pages instead of 350. Yeah. Now, speaking of page size, with ex with um, extras, are you shooting for or for for around a hundred around 150 pages? Yeah. So the interesting thing about this particular presentation, as I mentioned earlier in the talk, is we had a problem with the, with the books being printed and, and it was a long delay. So we could not run the Bessem Extras Kickstarter with all the expansions. We couldn't run it until the core books was in people's hands. We, we didn't want people feeling that there was kind of any kind of vaporware or something that we run a Kickstarter, we tell everyone about it, we collect the pledges, and then we run another Kickstarter of the same game without them having the first one fulfilled. So it was really important for us to get that done. Mm -hmm. So because it was so delayed getting that fulfilled until September, but all the expansions were done in advance. We actually sent all the expansions to the press before the Kickstarter even started. And right now, while the Kickstarter is running, the six different products in the Kickstarter are all going to be shipping from the factory to our, our warehouse. This this has a couple of advantages. The, the main one, of course, is that we can have a much faster turnaround on fulfillment. So when the Kickstarter ends in December, it will be December or at the latest January, provided you know there's no holdups on customs that are unexpected, mm -hmm. that we can actually send out the physical rewards. And from a uh, a Kickstarter point of view, I've never been involved. I've never backed any Kickstarter that fulfilled things, physical physical products in the same month or maybe one after on that. And that's because we did send everything to press early. Doing that has a few disadvantages, obviously. Uh, from a stretch goal point of view, we can't do a lot of physical stretch goals that improve or change the, the main product because it's already printed. It's already done. Okay. So in terms of how big it is, well, we know the size of it. So Bessem Extras is 144 pages. The Dramatis Personae book, which is a book of 70 plus NPCs, that's 144 pages. So that's kind of a, a sweet spot for our hardcovers that we really like that for an expansion mm -hmm. size. And that's the same size as uh, Bessem Naked. Now, when it came when it came to the initial the initial design of extras. Now, first off, did you already ha did you already have a gray box idea of what was going to be in extras before um, core was finished? Yeah, absolutely. So while we we're while I was writing the Bessem third edition or fourth edition, of course, because it builds on third edition, it builds on second and Tristat DX and Silver Age Sentinels and everything that was Tristat beforehand, mm -hmm. all of that fed into fourth edition. But then I looked and said, well, I, I don't want this rule in there and I don't want that rule and here's a better way to do it. And so I took out aspects that I thought were more suited for an expansion. And then I also knew in my head, th uh, you know, getting ideas when you're writing the core books, like, oh, it'd be really great if I could expand upon this particular aspect, uh, like Diceless. I wanted to have a diceless rules for Bessem. Mm -hmm. And it's not a huge section in Bessem Extras because it doesn't need a lot. It's just a stripping down the dice out of the game. Uh, how do you do that? And I knew that these were a bunch of things I wanted to do. And then during the writing, extra things came to me. It's like, oh, you know, well, I should probably do this. And we ended up having about 70 items statted out in the, the book uh, from many different genres. And a lot of those I didn't know that I wanted to do that until until the core book was out in the wild and people were talking about it online and what they liked and what they didn't like. And someone may mention, Oh, if I just knew how to do this particular thing. And I thought, Oh, that's, that's great. We should do that. Stat out that item. So a lot of the best extras was the formula and at least in my head was done before the core book was out, but then the rest of it came very shortly thereafter. All right. That makes, that makes sense. Now, when it came, when when it comes to uh, when it comes to extras now obviously you've done a few previews here and there for backers and you put out a pre a preview of the table of contents um when putting out a putting out a single page preview of the table of contents is something that i haven't seen done often with um kick with kickstarters large and small and what i'm curious about was that was Doing the table of contents a, a a means of showing, okay, this is what we've got planned for this book for this book, barring any stretch goals. Yeah, that was certainly a, a factor, and the, probably the biggest reason why you don't see that a lot is most kickstarters are run before the product is finished, and and I'm not talking about just printed. I'm talking about actually finished. So when we did the first best and fourth edition game, we ran the kickstarter when the book was probably eighty to ninety percent done. Uh, but I know a lot of Kickstarters, um, 
know, people will back it and they'll get their products two, three, four years later. Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons to release the table of contents was first of all, to show people it's, it's finished. We know everything on what page it is. Not only here's everything that's in the game to kind of whet your appetite. So you know, what's in extras, but also to show you it's done. And so we have a, a high degree of confidence. It's at the printer. Here's the table of contents. Uh, th this is golden. Yeah. And one thing, one thing that I, def that I definitely did notice is there is a good chunk of the exp of the expanded mater material that you've got planned is revolving around um, um, putting putting more complexity within combat. Now, yeah, people people like their crunchiness, right? We we know we know people want crunchiness, and when it comes to the game system, obviously Bessem is very front end heavy in terms of your power selection and what you can do because you yeah. can add on just about anything you can imagine. After that's done, the game uh, that aspect is is largely falls into the background, and so if people want any kind of crunch in their game, it's usually when it comes to rolling the dice. And th that's combat most of the time, not all the time, but often combat is the one crunchy aspect, even in rules like lighter games like Bessem, where the, the system can get a little bit crunchier when it comes to combat. And that's what we present in Bessem Extras. Yeah. Now, when it when it's um, when it came to do, when it came to doing so to doing um. A lot of the a lot of the combat motifs with it. Would you would you say that a good that a good chunk of that would um, a good chunk of the combat expansion would be geared towards certain genres within anime within anime? Um, I don't I don't really think so. I mean, there's some genres that you know if you're running a a slice of life high school regular people. Um, well, you're probably not using a lot of combat in there. Like those that the romantic comedy type games might not have much combat in them. So I would say certainly there are certain genres where it doesn't apply to as well. But whether it's a fantasy or science fiction uh, or something between or horror, the idea of I want to hit someone in a particular place, I want to do a called shot. Well, that's 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 ubiquitous. Every game, every genre has that aspect or critical hits. So I hit someone really, really well, mm -hmm. uh, whether that's with a sword or a laser blaster or a tentacle. Uh, it's certainly not uncommon to have that. So, uh, yes, there are certain genres that it's not as applicable to. But I would say outside of those really no combat or low combat zones, then most of the additional crunch and Bessem extras regarding the combat should be fairly universally applied. And whether it's, you know, if you we have a modifier for moving quickly in a vehicle when you're attacking someone. So obviously if you're in a car, driving a car and you're shooting a gun and you're driving really quickly, well, you have some sort of modifier. Well, you could also be riding a horse or flying a, a, a sky bison uh, and having the exact same effect. It's the concept of you are moving and you're firing at something while you are moving and it doesn't it could be a gun a crossbow a regular bow a, a laser blaster it doesn't make a difference so the aspect of Bessem being very very cross genre we wanted to make sure the rules could be applied to to almost anything people want to run with it which makes which makes sense now some now of course some of the um, some of the things that i'm seeing get get added in were, th were things that were in um, we're in the Tristat system previously, and of course, one of them being um, Shock. Um, when, but since I mentioned genre earlier, that that brings me to the whole the whole idea of um, very of uh, varying skill costs. Um, was that was that just a means to make to make it so that it so that when somebody is playing a specific style of genre? Um, the skill the skills that they can get are go are going to better fit in yeah somewhat certainly when whenever this was something that we introduced back in tristat dx whenever we took besom uh and then you know which was anime and then we had a skill list and then we did superheroes with silver sentinels and there was a skill list and you know all skills have a cost and then when we decided to do tristat dx as kind of a separate system of just tristat but but obviously expand it to multi-genre, that's when we we approach the cost of skills and how do we deal with that. Now, fast forward to fourth edition, and it was very clear to me I did not want individual skills system in Bessem fourth edition. I did want the main 
version of skills to be skill groups, which are much simpler. So you say, I have detective skills. I have adventuring skills. I have technical skills. And that is a, a lot easier rather than trying to, to select which specific skills you have. And that's the presentation we wanted to do in Bessem Extras yeah. or in Bessem. And then in Bessem Extras was going to be the individual skills. And so there's 60 different skills, which are all broken down. The idea of varying them um, according to the genre you're in when I came up with that concept of Triset DX, I didn't find it anywhere else. There was nowhere that I saw that kind of did that approach. And it was based not on how difficult the skill is, but its utility in the genre. So almost everyone is very familiar with most games. Um, skills that give you a big advantage, like uh, combat -y type skills or you know interrogation or things that a lot of adventurers use a lot, those are often the more expensive skills. Where if someone wants cooking or someone wants... Uh, like a domestic skill, or maybe uh, I want to play music, and so I'm a pianist, mm -hmm. something like that, those are often less expensive skills. And that's very common among most games. But in anime, of course, because Bessem is a multi-genre game, there are people that are going to want to play games where you're, you're running a food-based uh, RPG. That's mm -hmm. the whole setting. It's it's food wars. This is all about that. So wouldn't it make sense that the biggest advantage skills are going to be around domestic skills? Those are actually going to be more expensive than your detective skills and your interrogation skills. Because if if you're rarely ever using the detective skill, why not make that less expensive? So this cost of a skill depends on the genre you're in. Very different presentation, and we streamline those going forward in Bessem Extras. So we expanded the number of genres because, of course, you know, anime has changed over time and some new genres have come out. Uh, you know, there is effectively caveman or prehistoric anime. Mm -hmm. There's obviously all the, the historical type of anime, many different history uh, aspects. And so we wanted to price skills according to their utility and their benefit rather than their difficulty. Mm -hmm. And we're really happy with how that turned out. Not everyone's going to use it, if I'm running a game, I'm probably not going to use individual skills. I like the skill groups. I think that's just a really quick, simple way of packaging everything together. When I think of a lot of the anime characters, I don't think of all the individual things they can do. I think them in, in broad strokes. And that's why I want to use the the what's in the core game, which is the skill groups. Mm -hmm. But Bessem Extras give those individual skills for people that want those. Um now in, the, in, that in that regard, what can you tell me about the concept of genius skills? Is that your answer to knowledge skills? No, so genius skills are really really quite straightforward. We call them genius skills, but it's just, uh, you know, Bassam almost always works on a scale of one to six. So what if you want to go beyond six? I mean, if six is master level skill, mm -hmm. well, what's seven? What's eight? What's nine? And so we do address the concept of going beyond effectively mastery of a skill and, and what that entails. So it's uh, some people have been speculating about what specifically genius skills are, but it's really just how do you handle something that goes beyond uh, that level and, and what it would mean to go to, to a rank eight, for example, of yeah. a mechanical skill and, and what that would mean. Mm -hmm. Certainly it's very anime it certainly fits with a lot of anime shows that people are just that good. Yeah. Um, now, when it comes now, when it comes to oh, when it comes to the co the uh, combat and things, which as I had mentioned um, previously, um, how much? If you were to ratio how much of the material that gets getting expanded when it comes to combat is rooted in previous editions and how much of it is new to fourth edition what would you say that ratio is uh certainly a lot of a lot of it is going to be seen sometime in the past like it's mm -hmm. it's there's not a lot of concepts in besom extras that we have not covered in some form in all the years of publishing tristat books so mm -hmm. whether it's grappling or called shots or critical hits um, modifiers when you're moving or maybe uh, range penalties like all of those have been addressed in yeah. some form not always in core books sometimes in expansions mm -hmm. so a lot of that would be familiar of course how they're presented and how they're applied now that we have uh, the edges and obstacle system uh, mm -hmm. of using different numbers of dice and then taking the the best or the worst of the two of them so you have a minor obstacle so you're rolling three dice you have to take the lowest two to get your you know, between two and twelve mm -hmm. so that is a different presentation that was in previously but a lot of those combat modifiers are indeed 
uh, just variations of what was presented in the past and then updated. A couple of the new areas that we dealt with that we haven't really gone into before, we have uh, morale for NPCs. We haven't really addressed that in the past. And then a mass combat and a social combat system. And they both use the same underlying, I guess, structure or framework to do them, which which seems weird. Like, how would you have a mass combat, you know, armies fighting armies, and two people sparring over drinks at a, at a bar? How is that the same underlying system? Well, that's... You know, that's what's in Bessem Extra is it'll tell you what the framework is and, and how it's modified from there. So those are probably the, the largest ones that it would be in the combat type area, but they're a little bit different than anything we've presented in the past. Yeah. Now, since you mentioned mass and social combat, let's talk a bit about those. Now, I've seen um, mass combat in my fair share of games over the years. A lot of a lot of times, it's a very it's a very careful balancing act to not fall into one of two traps. One is making it is make is making it a full on subsystem, so it's almost like you've got a game and a half. Or two, you have the trap of um, it being it being too crun it being too crunchy. What's the approach that I, that can be expected with Besom when it comes to mass combat? Yeah, and that's what's, what's so wonderful about that. With when people read the mass combat section, which which is literally like a page and a half, mm -hmm. uh, and this could resolve a hundred year war between two different gigantic armies and resolve it in one roll. Like th when people read this section, they're going to see, oh, this is something new to Bessem, but it is very much a way of doing Bessem. You know, everything is streamlined uh, it's simple it's easy to understand and because it's again it has to be multi-genre so we have to have a mass combat system that can deal with two armies of of 20 units like a, a 20 orcs versus 20 elves mm -hmm. and also okay how do we deal with the mass combat sh system that has 10,000 ships versus another 10,000 ships from opposing armies yeah. and we have one system that deals with it all because Bessem is a more narrative system it, this isn't a just choose a winner but what you're doing is you're going to be looking at the different armies and then comparing their relative strength in a few different categories like you know which which army generally has higher combat fights? Which army generally has better equipment or weapons? Which which army has the advantage of territory, for example? Like if you're attacking a fortress, well, the defenders have a territorial advantage. Yeah. What about uh, mounted units, cavalry units, or spaceship units? Like something that is, you know, when you when you think about uh, medieval armies, the ones that have a slight a technological advantages and, and horses being a, a form of a technology they have an advantage. And so what you do is you just go through and you compare under say 10 different categories, which of the two armies would have advantages in these. And then when you compare the two at the end, that will give you your die roll modifiers yeah. that you're going to have under the edges and obstacles, uh, which is the, the core framework that we have for both mass and social combat. And then you make a roll and you can go from something that is, uh, you know, success level, so moderate successful, my, uh, majorly successful, mm -hmm. was it a slight success? And that will somewhat determine how long things are going to go. Yeah. Uh, and you can have the flow of combat time be appropriate for what you're trying to accomplish. Again, because it's multi-genre, what if you're tr you, you are running something that you need to resolve a hundred years of combat between the player characters and the NPCs, and you have to resolve that in 10 minutes? Yeah, because that's that's the type of game you're running. Not every game is going to be like that, but we gave the system that you, any game, any genre, any style, any setting can run with these these rules because they are so encompassing and yet very streamlined. And when it comes to when it comes to that whole concept of mass combat, and this was something that just popped popped in my head regarding it. Is the is the notion of having um, of having of having multiple phases? I I. And this is something I could easily see someone at my table bringing up because I have a fair amount of war gamers at, at my table. So, there. So in a lot of in a lot of war games, you have the phase, you have the shooting phase, and then the ch and then the um, charge, and then melee. And I'm wondering if um, all of that would be consolidated in one die roll, or if something like that could be split when you're dealing with ar when you're dealing with more combined st combined arm style um, armies. 
Yeah, you can certainly divide up using the same system. You can divide it up to cover whatever aspects of the battle you want. So while it is a one role resolution, it could be a one role will resolve one aspect of the the mass combat. So you're dealing with the initial volleys of uh, say say bows, and how how does that get resolved? Okay, once you have that resolved, now later they'll be moving into the cavalry, and how you're going to resolve that? Then you're going to move into the infantry. How are you going to resolve that? Mm -hmm. And some people may say, let's resolve the entire battle in one uh, setting, and they're going to look at all the yeah. parameters for that entire battle. And then other people will break it down, and they might not even handle. They might handle one aspect of it, say in one four-hour game session. Mm -hmm. They're going to deal with the initial scouting and initial skirmish level, and that will be one role resolution for that. And then the next session that they get together. It's the same battle, but they're going to be dealing with the cavalry units. And so they're going to do the mass combat rules for that particular aspect. So mm -hmm. people can break it down however they'd like. And that's uh, just the, the beauty of the system. It's one of the things I'm most proud of in Bessem Extras as the new stuff that hasn't come up anywhere. Because this was designed completely from scratch. The concept of it never existed before. We never did mass combat or social combat. And part of that was that we never had the underlying aspect of the system that made that possible. When we brought in the edges and obstacle rules, that mm -hmm. suddenly made these, everything just fell into place when I started looking at how do we do a mass combat approach. I knew I wanted to do it when I was writing fourth edition, but it wasn't until I sat down that I really have a good understanding of it. Yeah. Now, would it be fair of me to, to guess that when it comes to social combat, it's operating under similar levels of simplicity? Yeah, absolutely. It's just, it's the exact same style of, of way of comparing stuff. So in social combat, you will have people like how many friends do they have nearby like the social support that would be an advantage that they'd have you might have people that are uh they they have the territorial advantage in a social combat situation uh what about uh status you know obviously the character that has a higher social status or privileged status whoever is more privileged will have an advantage in social combat uh, whether we want to admit it or not that's kind of how things work Our, most societies work on privilege so again you'd compare these these two things even even something about who's physically uh bigger and tougher I mean, that's another thing. If you're if you're physically imposing, then in a social combat situation, you're probably going to be coming out ahead uh, because you can be very imposing and, and physically dominating someone that you're sparring with, uh, even if it's just with words. And so all of this is wrapped up and presented in a very simple system that uses the, the same framework as the mass combat, but is on a very, very personal and social scale as opposed to physical scale. Yeah. Now... When it comes to the when it comes to the um, optional rules that are that are in, there's there's a few that, there's a few that I was um, curious about. Um, one of them is one of them is the is the matter of alternate stat costs. Now, obviously, obviously, going into the crunchy part of alternate stat costs is um, be, is beyond the scope of this interview, but. I'm curious about the feel of alternate stat costs and what would be the what would be the reasoning why someone might um, take those alternate stat and attribute co cost approaches. Yeah, and, and that's a, a great thing. Of course, what we're looking at doing is presenting just options for people to have. I mean, everyone's going to choose what they what they want and what they like in the game and what they do, the, the don't from the extra rules. And we want to to show people not just, well, here's what you can choose from and, and choose what we give you, but also to get people thinking about how they can do things differently and presenting the different stat costs. I mean, in, in the core game, all of your stats, your body, mind, and soul all cost two points each. But what if someone said, well, you know, I want a scaled cost. So, you know, the fact that someone going from uh, a four in a stat versus an eight, well, an eight is a huge advantage over a four. I don't want it to just cost double the amount. I want it to scale up. And so we want a scaled cost. So kind of like the every every level is more difficult than the previous one. So we present the opposites, uh, options for that. In fact, I think we may be the only game to present a Fibonacci sequence costing for stats um, mm -hmm. in the game. And that was one of the options. So it becomes much more expensive when you get up to you know, your 10s, 11s, and 12s, it's just astronomically expensive to have something that high. And for some games, that may be appropriate. We also present the idea of, well, what if your first four levels, four being adult human average? So what if your first four levels are free? So you don't pay anything if you want to be an average human. 
And then after that, it's now five points per level. So much more expensive to go beyond the average human level. But to be a human doesn't cost anything. It just, it's an average cost. And so we wanted to show people, hey, you, you can take our system and toy with it a little bit. We do address the game balance because of course, in a point-based game, everything has been balanced from a point point of view against everything else. And so if you start messing with something too much uh, of how much particular stats cost, then you might be throwing that out of balance with some of the derived aspects of it uh, in attributes, for example, or defects. So we do address the fact that you have to consider other things, but we present some variations to say, if you don't want it just be the way it is, if you want it to be simple, here's a couple of options to look at. And so that was one of the things we thought was a, a good way to get people thinking about, hmm, maybe, maybe I can make this game my own by doing what I want to do. And we're really happy with how that turned out. Mm -hmm. Now, um, now, when it comes to dynamic initiative, um, I'm guess now I'm guessing that that it, that is a um, means of sh of shifting away from the static initiative of okay, everybody roll everybody roll initiative, and that's the fixed turn order for this encounter. Um, what can you tell me about how dynamic initiative would differ from that approach? Yeah, well, that's certainly the, the big thing is to streamline the game to make it nice and simple. You roll your initiative once and at the beginning of combat, and that's your initiative. You know, every round is the exact same. Well, some people want to change things up to round to round. So every round you do an initiative roll, and we're calling that dynamic initiative. It just makes every round a little bit different, so it's not quite as predictable, and it changes it up a little bit more. It's more dice rolling. But not every gamer group is is against dice rolling, and it was a little bit more complex, but not so much more complex that some gamers group won't be determined that's exactly what they want to do. So it's just the difference of uh, a one combat initiative versus round by round initiative. Mm -hmm. And personally, I've I've um, in some games I've d I've done I've opted for something a little bit in be in between that, where initiative is as much of a resource as um, and as anything else is. I, I e if some I, if somebody let's say somebody is um wants to put wants to put a little bit more oomph in a spell that they're casting they're going to they're not going to pay in index in additional spell points or some equivalent they're going to be paying an initiative because it's going to take more time to gather the energy they need um and when it comes and um that's oh, that's also something I could see, or some, or if somebody gets hit really hard in the middle of a combat, obvi obviously they're going to they might have to roll one die and then take that hit and then take that um, hit to initiative because well you just got knocked loopy. Um, well, and and we do have some rules that actually change the initiative during the rounds with uh, people can hold their initiatives for example to yeah. you know kind of doing a ready action and so if you're holding your initiative, you're going to be changing your initiative going forward for future rounds too. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes now, um, when it when it comes to in, when it comes to injury rules, now I this is the part where I will admit, um, one of my early introductions was the was the was the book of charts known as Rollmaster, and it's um, many 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 injury tables. And obviously, you're not go you're not going for something like that. But when it comes to injury rules with um, extras, what can we expect? Well, certainly going along with the other presentations in the book about giving players options is we do present a number of different ways to calculate damage. So once again, core book, it, your damage is always static. You don't roll for damage. Well, what if you want to have variable damage? So every time you make a hit, it's successful. It's not always going to give the exact same amount. It's going to depend upon these other factors. And we present several different ways to determine how damage is going to be determined and it's a variable damage option it could be depending on on percentages it could bend on uh levels of success of your role like how how more uh how much higher was your die roll versus your opponent for example so we present diet damage options for that but in addition we talk about you know some some standard stuff for non-combat damage so obviously you can you get damage if someone hits you with a sword what about poison what about if you fall what if you're in a vehicle and it crashes you know so we address those and then some expanded injury rules that we have about, you know, like you can, you do, how much damage do you take from pain, for example? Because not all damage is like from a physical laceration. Sometimes you get, you're in pain and you can take damage from pain itself uh, or stun damage. 
and how you can you know look at at hitting someone with a sap to knock them out mm -hmm. and how does that play into effect because the base rules again if it doesn't really kind of go into that differentiation so it's a little more refinement of what damage is and, and how to consider what's going to happen with damage like uh, all the different environmental considerations drowning uh, or freezing uh, exposure to acid you know these environmental considerations are also part of damage not all of it is going to apply to everyone's games and sometimes people want to abstract things a little more easily rather than going into the greater detail but we do cover some of that for people that want that more crunch this mm -hmm. is what we're presenting to them yeah um now, when it comes to the, the concept of packs and bundles, um, now obvious, uh, now a lot of them are a lot of them are very root. A lot of the ones that I see in this table of contents are very rooted in um, extra normal slash supernatural abilities. And what I'm curious about is what where would um, where would these sort of packs and power packs and power bundles be similar and different to templates? Yeah, so power packs and power bundles are two kind of streamlined ways of presenting stuff. That we we address them a little bit in third edition, but we kind of just made them a little bit more obvious and straightforward in fourth edition. So a power pack, these are collections of modifiers, usually limiters, that would apply to a particular set of attributes you have. I mean, in a classic example, think of the the standard kind of D and D wizard. Mm -hmm. So your D and D wizard, he might have a lot of different attributes. He has the flight ability, uh, and he has teleportation ability, and he has weapon ability. But for each of his spells, he might require certain types of requirements like somatic components. So he has to speak. He has to wave his arms while he's doing them. Or maybe there's a physical components like uh, you need spell components like dust or frog's breath or feathers from a particular animal and so what these what packs are is they're collections of parameters that would apply to your attribute where you could just write them down individually mm -hmm. but by putting them as a pack it just saves you from writing them every way so the wizardry power packs is a great example so we have um, consumable so you have a focus, like which is basically your spell components. Mm -hmm. You will have that it uses up energy. So we have the deplete limiter. So it uses energy every time you cast a spell, as well as detectable in the sense that he's going to be the, the, the spell casters waving their arms and they're speaking out loud, doing the incantations. Mm -hmm. And finally, that they are very powerful what they're doing. So it's, it's potent. So this is actually an enhancement rather than a limiter. And so they get an advantage. They're going to make a, an edge with their roll so to get three dice instead of just two dice well all putting it all together that is effectively a, it's a plus three power pack which means every attribute that they have the effective levels increased by three levels because they've assigned these these requirements to it so if you want to teleport and you only have level one teleport well it will function at a level four teleport but you have to have all these requirements if you're missing uh this particular spell component you can't do it i mean that's what the limiters are and so rather than writing your teleportation ability and then writing consumable plus one deplete plus two deplete, detectable plus one and potent minus one rather than writing that you just say teleportation wizardry plus three Mm -hmm. And that's just a short form way of it's a pack. It's a pack of limiters enhancements that will apply to your attributes to reflect what you want in the game. And we have six of them. We present them in the game. This is not exhaustive, certainly. Um, certainly, if someone can come up with their own types of, of packs that they want, but this will show them how to do their own packs as well as, well, if you want to, to jump right in, if you want a, a, a Psy pack. So I am, I'm a Psyonicist, and hey, this is a great collection, and so I'm just going to use it exactly from Bessem Extras, and so all of my attributes that I have, because they're based on Psyonics, will all have the Psy pack with it. Power bundles are closer to spells, like individual spells. Think of your magic missile, fireball, lightning bolt, all those spells from kind of a, a traditional game like D&D. &D. Yeah. But the, we don't call them spells because spells implies magic, and bundles don't have to have any kind of magical component. They could be technological, magical, they can be spiritual, they can be psionic, they can be divine. We, we don't because that's the, the nature of Bessem. We don't tell you why something happens. We just tell you the effect of it, and then you can move forward with that. So what we do with bundles is we're, we have 60 pre-made packages of attributes that you'd say is close to a spell, and 
then you could just use it exactly as it is, just like you could look and appear, you know, say you're done in the Dragon's Player's Handbook and grab the Lightning Bolt spell, and it'll tell you exactly what to do. That's what these are. These are pre-built powers um, that you could call them spells, but we're calling them bundles because they are bundles of abilities. So just a, a really simple one. We have, uh, I'm, just, I'm just pulling something up here from the rules. So fear itself. We call it fear itself if it's a perception bundle. Mm -hmm. And what this is, is if the, the, the characters, if they can pick up the surface thoughts of the character, then they can convince, they can make illusions that are sufficiently horrific based on the target's fears that they can actually do physical damage and physical pain. It's a pretty standard, you know, very uh, active illusion in that sense. Yeah. And so we have the illusion attribute the tele telepathy attribute and the weapon attribute all tied into there. So you need telepathy and then illusion depends upon your telepathy. The weapon depends upon the illusion. So mm -hmm. you, you can't do the weapon unless the illusion works and the illusion won't work unless the telepathy works to read their fears. And we kind of bundle all together and we say it's 21 points. Mm -hmm. So if you want to have this particular bundle of abilities and we, you want to have the fear itself spell or the fear itself psionic ability or technological item then it's 21 points we tell you how to build it here it is here's a great example and we do have 60 of these in, in um, 10 each in six different categories which are meant to serve both as examples to do your own as well as things you can just use exactly as they are out of the book and that's just something that people have often wanted i mean Bessem, because it's it's multi-genre and it covers so much we can't go into too many examples in the core book as it is it's 350 pages mm -hmm. well what what we did in Bessem extra is that allows us to give some of those more expansions on the ideas and provide those those concepts through examples whether it's the, the bundles or we have another 70 items in the book and again this is to give people an idea of that we can use it exactly as it is or here's how we can build from it because i'll take what they have here as inspiration which it's a very interesting approach that and it's something that i don't see in a whole lot of universal games because a lot of times in universal games whether it whether it be champions whether it be gurps whether it be savage worlds and so on and so forth um the one attribute that they ha that a lot of them struggle with is magic or some sort of casting equivalent, whether it be magic, psionics, what shamanism, what have you. And a lot of because a lot of times it's basically a case of you use this attribute to replicate the effects of other attributes, and it gets really, really crunchy. And with it, with something like this, I can see an easing of the matter, not necessarily hand holding, but anti hand breaking. Yeah, it's it's a range of what we have. We have from the incredibly rules light version, dynamic powers, yep. which is basically you can do whatever you can want to do, working with your game master up to a certain level, mm -hmm. like like a moderate level spells or or primal level ability and you work with them and you can do anything within that range mm -hmm. i mean often that's that very free form way of doing it is very very rules light up to the more crunchy uh, aspect which is individual packs and bundles which divide them up uh, very very specifically um, and it would be in some ways uh, because we're we're not just giving you the list of things we're telling you the application of it as well that suddenly gives it a genre it gives it a setting it gives it those parameters and that becomes a little more crunchy as soon as you start telling people the specifics of it and so we wanted to make sure we cover the entire range this is it'll never be role master they appeal to people that love role master and it'll never uh, appeal to people who want their rpgs on a single page and everything's is a narrative story but we try to find a balance between kind of those those two polars yeah, and that's that's something like that's something I can um, I can definitely go with, um, especially since there there's one of their um, attributes attributes set up that's always had a bit of a a bit of a crunchiness issue that I've had to work around work around several times in the past because I'm a big I'm a big fan of Tokusatsu, um, and. One and in and I know that there I know that there was there's been the Sentai member template in Be in Basm for years, but the tok the Tokusatsu that I've um, that I've tried to tackle in the past and have had difficulty with is trying to replicate Common Rider. Um, 
especially some of the motifs that have shown up with Kamen Rider in the um, Heisei era. So, i.e. The, e. the last 20 years. Well, up until 2019, because 2020 we weren't in the Heisei era anymore. We were in the Reiwa era. And a lot, of a lot of times when I look at Universal style games and I ask, how am I going to do Kamen Rider? They'll usually say, alternate form. <laughs> and the problem with doing that is that I effectively have to make two sheets. <laughs> um, but by going dynamic and having these, having these sort of packs, it definitely makes my job easier, and obviously it's going to make the player's job easier because it means that they're not going to have to have, the, have a um, small book in front of them whenever they want, whenever, if, if they want to play their XP of Common Rider Blade or something like that. <laughs> right and and you know we, we hope that we can provide a, a range of options to to meet what everyone wants so some people are going to want to have those highly detailed alternate forms that are going to stat them out and it could be you know more than one it could just be one alternate or it could be a whole bunch of them what other people are very happy like if you got your traditional shape changer mm -hmm. so uh, think of someone who just can take on any form well obviously you, you need a very open-ended system to handle that. And we have that with either power flux or dynamic powers, depending on how crunchy you want your open-ended system to be. Mm -hmm. um, I remember that. I remember one that I, that I particularly had difficulty with was trying to emulate the, um, the whole half and half approach that is used in common writer double. Cause in that one, he, ha he has effectively a combat style as one half and an element on the other. So, which leads to a total of nine potential forms. And yeah, I mean that that sounds like I think it would be a complex one to to have yeah. detailed game stats for something like that. Certainly, um, I remember trying to do that with um, he, with Hero because that was what I was asked to use at the time, and um, I managed to do it, but it wasn't easy. <laughs> <laughs> and. Now, when it comes to the now, when it comes to adventuring elements, um, one and en one entry that I that I saw that's just a single page entry that I'm curious about is going big. Is that primarily um, the a set a set of rules if somebody wanted to do kaiju st sized um, affairs? No, not big as in uh, tall, big, but big as in powerful. So again, most games, most anime games are going to run at a certain power level. But what if yeah. you want to run a Super Saiyan, Dragon Ball Z, destroy planet type level? I mean, you could be gigantic, but you don't have to be. Um, so how do you handle that? So stats above 12, we address that. We, we talk about planetary power or something that can, uh, like what if you have, you were the god of storms and you can control violent weather across the entire planet? Well, how do you do that? Mm -hmm. And so we, we just talk about concepts to to consider because rolls, are, a lot of dice rolls are going to become irrelevant when you're super, super powerful. If I am, uh, you know, I, if I'm the god of guns and that's my character concept, well, suddenly maybe combat rolls aren't, maybe I don't need to make rolls and I'm in combat mm -hmm. because I'm the god of guns. Um, and so we, we address that and we also talk about, of course, player ability versus character ability. So... Yeah. We, we acknowledge that obviously players have a, a, a strong role in determining the direction of the character, but what if you can't possibly m match the level of the character you're trying to play? And you can't, I can't think of someone that has, that is a, a brainiac level, you know, Washu from Tenchi Muyo, best scientist in the universe. I can't think of how she would operate. And so we, we addressed concepts about, um, allowing characters to do things that the players can't come up with. And and finally, of course, we also have to talk about uh, narrative in as many ways replaces the gaming aspect of something. When you're dealing with super powerful characters, sometimes it's not about the game system, it's about the story. And mm -hmm. that has to be a strong consideration. Yeah. Um, now, when it comes to, when it comes to um, firearms, um, is... Now, obviously, a lot of a lot of um, a lot of weapons and a lot of weapons and armor are in a are in a kind of unified equipment list that is, that covers gear and a lot of and a lot of other stuff. But when it came to um, firearms, you gave it you gave it its own section, and especially especially when it comes to customizing firearms, um, 
was that so, was that something that had been request been requested, or did you already plan for having custom firearms in the thing? No, so that's actually um, a throwback to the third book we ever published with, uh, for Bessem, which was Hot Rods and Gun Bunnies. Uh -huh. That uh, that was written back for first edition Bessem, and and that was all about you know, custom modding your vehicles and your guns. And so it seemed appropriate to carry that forward in extras. It's, mm -hmm. you know, some people are happy with abstracting stuff, but other people, you know, want to know, uh, you know, how do I get an extra 25 kilometers an hour out of my vehicle by, you know, hot swapping out a different type of engine uh, or adding in, you know, uh, uh, a, Ni a Niox boost, for example, like how does this play out? Uh, spiked tires uh, and just little customizations like that. And same with, with guns, you could have your briefcase firing, you can have silencers. So these are our accessories or pieces of gear or features or, or items if they're super powerful on ways to just modify your weapons. Usually, of course, you're, you're probably not going to put a scope on a, on a crossbow uh, or, or an actual bow, you know, so the most of them are, are kind of modern day technology technology but these are people that want to be those hot runs and gun buddies type characters mm -hmm. and that's what they want to they they enjoy doing it it's not going to be for everyone but for those that want it it's here and given the given the amount of given um the meme of the of the over modded gun that i that i've seen get that you seen get tossed around on shadow run forums there's obviously a precedent Oh. Yeah, some people some people love that stuff. It's it's not my cup of tea. It's it's not where I I mean I I'm a very very rules like gamer, and so that's just not as important to me. But other people and, and other genres, I mean it it's not important to me often because I don't run those types of hyper realistic modern day type settings. Yeah. Uh, if you're going to, it's probably a really good addition to have that type of flavor that you can give to your characters. I um. I could see I could see myself run, I could see myself using a firearm customization system if I was running something that was inspired by say Gunsmith Cats because the creator of that series is a, is a bona fide gun nut so I so I figured it'd be best to um to follow suit with some, with something like that um, yeah, certainly. I mean, that uh, you know, riding bean is a uh, prime example of a uh, of an early kind of hot rod type show. Mm -hmm. Certainly apply to something like that as well. Yeah. And give and given the popularity of series like Initial D, um, again, there's again there's a bit of a precedent. Now, when it comes to going diceless, now I I will admit that di that diceless systems are kind of my Achilles heel. Um, it's like asking me to crochet with boxing gloves on, but oh, in times in the past, I've seen, um, diceless games work more on managing a resource. Um, Marvel Universe, the redheaded stepchild of Marvel RPGs worked in that kind of, um, fashion. Um, is diceless besom on a, on a similar ma manner of managing a, cer a certain type of resource? Or would diceless work a little bit differently? Yeah, no, it's a it's a full on on different way of approaching stuff. And uh, you know, my background with with amber diceless is you know to me is always going to be the number one role playing game, and I just fell in love with it when I moved on from Dungeons and Dragons mm -hmm. into amber, and I loved it. And the the idea of you can run combat dicelessly, well, we we're not going that level of, of simplicity uh, of it. But the idea of taking out the random elements and stripping things down to to just looking at the numbers. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and a great example that comes up in, in Amber all the time, because people say, how, how do you run diceless combat? How do you run a diceless system? There's always a chance something will happen. And they say, well, I mean, if you were to to play the best chess player in the world, do you have any chance of beating them? And no, it, you have zero chance. It does, there's no random die roll that you could have that would make me be able to beat at a game of chess someone who's the best chess player. But what if I had someone give them a call and said, hey, you know, we're holding your family hostage. You better lose to Mark. Um, well, maybe suddenly uh, now I can beat him in a game of chess because it suddenly changes on what's happening. And that's from a story point of view. So with Dice's Combat, what we've done is we've, it's it's Dice's actions you know, and the simple way of doing diceless actions is simply do what we, we call hedging in the core game. And when you're hedging, it's very simple. You're just taking a seven on all your die rolls. I mean, that's the easiest way to make something diceless is just take out the random rolls. 
but we want a little bit more robust system for combat specifically. And so it's going to look at at many different aspects of your character, whether it's how many health points do they have, uh, you know, who's better at attacking or defending in combat, who has better equipment, who has better armor, um, if people have dice, um, uh, be able to reroll dice, for example, with the mulligan attribute. Maybe people can use their energy points as reserves to modify their dice rolls. And so what you're looking at is the aspects that make up a character's combat ability without the actual rolls and using that to then modify a situation of who would be better in combat. So this isn't as simple as taking taking seven, uh, you know, doing a hedging, but it's looking and saying, if you take the totality of a person's combat aspects versus their opponent's totality of their combat aspects, reasonably, who's going to be better? And then what margin of success is that? So if, if my combat value is a 12 and I have massive guns and I have great armor, and you have a combat value of three and you have a, a just a, a crappy little pistol and you have leather armor well i'm probably going to be so much vastly better than you uh in a diceless combat situation and so suddenly the amount of injury you're going to take is going to be dependent on the fact that i'm so much better than you are so that comes down to a to a scale of how big the spread between competencies are but all from a diceless point of view using the combat aspects of the character, but ignoring the random elements of it. And we find that this is a, a great way for people that want those a little bit more streamlined way of doing combat without having to keep track of, of health points each round. And this weapon, I, I hit you and my weapon does this much damage and you have this many health points and then keep tracking it on a, on a very minor aspect of it. We have something that's a little bit more narrative in the description. We have uh, something you can look at and say, well, you're roughly equal and there there's roughly going to be a tie and so the both people involved in combat are going to suffer minor injuries and then they're going to realize that they're equally matched i mean you have a, your classic example of two people with guns and they're they're equivalent to each other and so they're going to be able to realize that as the combat goes on and so the diceless game is is very simple just hedge all of your roles but diceless combat we wanted something a little bit more holistic which is why we came up with a system of rules for that all right now i know you i know you mentioned about per, about percentage of um, progress but how how far how far along how far along would you say the manuscript is for besom extras is that it is at a similar amount of like 85 percent so no besom so the book is done it's printed already okay. So uh, yeah, everything for this Kickstarter is printed already. Uh, it's done and going to be shipping uh, in dur during the Kickstarter while it's going on. Will be uh, coming from overseas. All right. Um, what would you say the release window would would um, be? Are you shooting for first quarter twenty twenty one? So or for for the for the Kickstarter backers, mm -hmm. all of the physical pledges will be done either in December or January. I mean, mm -hmm. certainly uh, if it's international, January at the earliest because mm -hmm. they have to ship over there. But uh, for domestic, uh, both U.S. and Canada, it depends a little bit about uh, shipping times and customs times. But we're hoping December, but we're mm -hmm. we're telling people January and earlier if possible. And that will be all six of the new products, if, uh, up to six if they pledge for everything. In yeah. terms of the retail release, what we're doing is we're actually going to be staggering the release in three waves of two products in February, April, and June. And so even though someone might be able to get all six products in their hands in December, if they back it on the Kickstarter, the final products won't be hitting retail stores until June. And that's because we don't want to inundate retailers with everything at once uh, you know the the lifeline of a product is we want to make sure we drip it out over time to always make sure that it's it's around and available and always getting that kind of spotlight for a line like this and we didn't feel that especially around christmas time to just dump everything uh at once into retailers laps was probably a smart idea so they'll be coming over over the first two quarters of 2021 in retail stores but of course for the kickstarter backers uh they'll be able to get it right away um, when it comes when it comes to when it comes to digital, I'm guessing that I'm guessing that'll be happening a bit sooner. 
Yeah, absolutely. So the digital will be within a week or so of the Kickstarter closing. Once we we close it, then we move on to the management aspect to, to collect the final pledges and the shipping funds or or get people addresses and all this stuff. And as soon as that's all collected, which you know everyone works kind of at their own pace, some people jump on it immediately and answer their surveys and, and get it done right away. And some people take a little bit longer, but we can fulfill all of the digital rewards uh, immediately because as soon as the 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 Kickstarter is done, they can all be uploaded to drive through for the PDFs and, and fulfilled right away. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll, cer I'll certainly be looking forward to how, to how that, um, how that develops. Oh, but with, with all that, with all that in mind, uh, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and braving the mist of time zones to come up to the temple. Oh, and of course, any any time you see fit to return, the door is always open. Yeah, so thanks. My my pleasure. Really appreciate you having me on here, and uh, it was great to come back for another visit. And uh, as I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Uh, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>